So it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. As you just heard, uh, it's T. Boone Pickens, who has been an icon in uh, corporate America and revitalizing uh, what we do. Um, now, most recently, he's been known for his uh, Pickens plan. I'm going to let him talk about most of it. When I first heard it, I was in an audience similar to this bunches of years ago. And I have to recount, um, you know, he, he got, went on the board and drew 700B. And at that time, is, that's how much money we're sending overseas to import oil. Um, and he tried to explain why he was, this was what he was concentrating on. And he was uh, even then talking about natural gas as a transportation fuel. And he said, well, my friends came up to me and said, T. Boone, are you terminal? And what does it mean, terminal? It's like, I mean, have you been diagnosed with something and there's only a limited amount of time and you're, you know, so he said, I'm here to assure you I'm not terminal. <laughs> so as far as I know, uh, he, uh, that was many, many years ago. I don't know how many years ago, at least a half a dozen years ago. But uh, I think T. Boone's has challenged corporate America to uh, think differently about approaches. Uh, and he has been focused most recently on alternatives to transportation fuel. Uh, this is making sure that uh, we can decrease our um, imports of foreign oil uh, by focusing on American energy assets, but also, most properly, how do we uh, diversify our energy supply for transportation? It doesn't always have to be oil-based, which it has been in the past. It could be natural gas, part of it could be natural gas-based, electricity in uh, plug-in uh, hybrids and electric vehicles. It could be in uh, next generation biofuels. It could be many, many things. And so you're, he's here to talk to you about that vision. What ultimately motivates T. Boone Pickens in that vision was that he's fundamentally, and I've gone to uh, appreciate this, he's fundamentally a patriot who really cares about the United States and he cares about the future of the United States. And uh, I hope he'll talk a little bit about that as well. But let's welcome T. Boone Pickens. Secretary, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Secretary Chu and I had lunch together today, and we have been. We can you hear that better? I'll go over here. They, um, uh, we had lunch together, talked about energy, of course. And, you know, when I look back over it, that, and what I've tried to accomplish is really to explain uh, the best way out of our dependency on OPEC crude. And when you look at our presence in the Persian Gulf, uh, you would have to say we're there, at least in part, for the protection of crude oil. And back, I can remember when it was, it was February 1949, and I was in college at Oklahoma State, and my dad came for a little ceremony there, and, and everything was a very nice day until we walked out on the lawn, uh, and he was getting ready to go home, and he said, before I leave, we don't think, your mother and I do not, do not think you're on the same plan to graduate that we have you on. And I had to nod, yes, I'm not on the same plan, I don't think. He said, well, we're going to stick to our plan. You're going to get out of here in June of 1951. And I said, okay. And he said, and you're going to have a degree in either engineering or geology. And okay, I'm getting a picture. And he said, son, let me tell you, he said, a fool with a plan can beat a genius with no plan. Your mother and I are afraid we have a fool with no plan. <laughs> the next, that was on a Sunday. Monday, I had my transcript. I was over with the Dean of Geology. I said, I got to get out of here by June of 51. And 
he helped me and looked at it. And he said, you know, Pickens, you go to one summer school, carry two 18s and a 19, and you've got it. I said, okay, let's just change it. I'll get to summer school at 19 and two 18s. I did. I was out in June of 51. I had a plan. From that point forward, I have always had a plan. We have never had a plan in this country for energy. We talked about a lot of things. If you go back to Richard Nixon, he said elect men will be energy independent. But from Nixon forward, it was elect me and will be energy independent. The rest of candidates for president. Now, Obama was a little different. He said elect me and in 10 years we will not import any oil from the Mideast. But no plan. Never again have I already heard him mention that. But I do remember, because I was at Denver, when he said it at the Democrat convention. But we have to have a plan, and the reason we've never had a plan is because we've had cheap gasoline. And it, it somehow, you know, we complain about $2 gasoline and $2.50, $3. Now we're complaining about $4, $4.50. Is it going to be 5 It's still half the price of gasoline in most of the rest of the world. The United States has the cheapest energy of any country in the world. We're 20% cheaper on oil. We are 75% cheaper on natural gas and 50% cheaper on gasoline. Now, there are other countries that subsidize. You know what I'm talking about. Don't, don't count those. But countries that really have, uh, you know, that we would compare to industrialized countries, we are the cheapest. What an opportunity, what an opportunity to rebuild your economy on the back of cheap energy. Uh, I'm, so we, I, we don't have any questions today, and I know I'm in, a, in an audience here that uh, probably a lot of you are not with me on some of the things I'm saying. I know you're listening to me. We've got a nice audience, and I appreciate that. But the, uh, uh, I'm all American. Anything American will do for me on energy. So you say, well, what's the guy selling? I'm selling America is what I'm doing. And uh, uh, that Dr. Chu said that I uh, was a patriotic American. I am patriotic American. I, uh, I want us to get on our own resources. First question should be, hold it, pal. Do we have the resources? We've got the resources. Well, but you're not counting wind, solar, and uh, power for uh, the battery and all to, for uh, transportation fuel. I am. I'm counting everything in the deal. But we have had something very, very unusual happen in this country. That is, we have more natural gas than any other country in the world. We went from like page two to number one. And the way that happened is that we figured out how to extract gas from the source rock. Now, this geologist, when you were drilling a well, you, would, you had a gas analyzing unit on the well. And when you, went, when you got down to a shale section, that was going to take two or three, four hours to drill. And you knew it because you were correlating to another well, that you knew that this was carboniferous shale. And you knew that that gas analyzer would continually bing, 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 bing all the time. If it was in the night, you'd get up and cut it off because you couldn't sleep. And, but here you were, knew you were drilling source rock. Never did this geologist, and I think I'm a pretty good uh, visionary, did I ever imagine that you were going to be able to extract gas out of that source rock. That's exactly what's happened. So we went number one on page one on reserves of natural gas. The biggest gas field in the world will be from Pennsylvania across West Virginia, and that is a Marcellus. It hasn't been totally proven yet, but you know what it is because you can see the configuration of the shale basin, and you know it's, it's all productive, all productive. It, it's from like on a scale of one to 10, it'll be from like three to 10 plus. We know the gas up in the northeast, Susquehanna County, Wyoming County, in the east of Pennsylvania, those are, those are gigantic wells 
producing out of a rock that has 4% porosity. So this has all come to us, you, me, and the rest of America. Not just the Marcellus, but you got the Haynesville, you got the Barnett, you, you've got these other reservoirs all over the United States. And to date, nobody else has been able to duplicate it around the world. Another sad story about a well in uh, Poland today. Looks good, Devonian reef should produce, doesn't. I'm not going to say that, that none of these other uh, fields of shale, source rock, are not going to produce. But to date, the United States is the only one that has developed this. Now, you say just wait till they drill a few more wells around the world and we'll see what happens. But to date, we have, we have the gas. We're fools if we don't use it. It's 30% cleaner than diesel, for instance. It's cheaper, it's abundant, and it's ours. I started to sell this idea in 1988, and I said, give me three years. If I can't sell cheaper, cleaner, abundant than ours, I'm not much of a salesman. Okay, 88 to 2013, 25 years, I'm still selling it. I haven't sold it yet. You're not convinced. Maybe you are, some of you are, maybe a few. But this is a resource that we have to use in this country. And you can recover the economy off of the resource. So it's uh, the, uh, the who do you give credit for it is credit goes to the domestic oil and gas industry. They develop the horizontal drilling. That's the key to it. The fracking is something that's been around for a long, long time. Over 800,000 wells have been fracked in the United States. I've fracked 2,000 myself, never having a failure on any one of the 2,000. So the, uh, but that is, the fracking was in place, the horizontal drilling was the new factor. Go down, get in the zone, stay in the zone, and drill a mile, 5,000 feet out, and have 5,000 feet of the productive sand uh, open to the well bore it gave you a, a, uh, a technique, a technology, and a resource we couldn't imagine. But let me go to a little bit about markets and all. That today we talk, and I, a, a senator uh, unnamed, that I go through this story with him, and he says, you're trying to make me pick winners. Really? You don't think Congress picks winners? Continually, they pick winners. Is there anything wrong with it? I'm not arguing for or against winners, but when it gets down to domestic natural gas, our OPEC oil, OPEC oil being diesel, natural gas, of course, there are only two fuels that move an 18-wheeler. No battery moves it. Uh, gasoline, no. Ethanol, no. Will it move it? Barely. But diesel and natural gas are the only two fuels. So if you don't pick natural gas, the domestic fuel, you get OPEC. So when you get down to two, one is yours and one is, I always feel like OPEC's the enemy because I feel like money that goes in to OPEC oil, uh, especially that oil coming out of the Mideast, some part of that goes to the Taliban. And but let me make a point about the Mideast. Today, there's 17 million barrels of oil that are coming through the Straits Hormuz. 17 million. How much of that comes to us? 12%. We get less than 2 million barrels of that a day. We have our fifth fleet there. We have uh, two aircraft carriers inside Persian Gulf, two just outside of the theater. We have actually have people, of course, on the ground, as you well know, and we have casualties daily over there. Why are we there? We're supposed to disrupt uh, Al Qaeda and Taliban or whatever and, and get them in there, uh, there before they come here and get us. Uh, that's one argument. But they'll always, and if, you talk, if the conversation goes three or four minutes, that whoever you're talking to, military or whatever, you're there because of the oil. 
straits harmut so you want to keep that open flowing and all who is it, are you keeping it open flowing for it's 17 million barrels a day you're using less than two so 15 of it is going to uh europe china around the world and i asked it at the pentagon i said do you charge them for keeping this open yeah you laughed at me didn't you they said well you could charge them they wouldn't pay us if we don't have to have any oil from the Mideast, why are we there? Okay. Thank you. Well, you know, why in the hell are we there? We get people killed over there. We're spending uh, an old number, year old. We had a trillion seven hundred billion that went into Iraq, Afghanistan. We lost 7,000 people and had 34,000 injured. And if we don't have to be there, we're fools to spend the money and lose our people like that. So give ourselves an option. Do we have the resources? We have the resources. For instance, if you just took the five to eight million 18 wheelers in the United States and moved it to natural gas away from diesel, one, you'd save a dollar and a half to two dollars a gallon. And all of this is happening. It doesn't have to have government assistance, approval, or anything. But the government stand up and say, this is the direction we should go on our own resources, that it would help. It would, it would be clear to everybody that the government believes this is a good idea. But if you did that, and it could be accomplished within five years, that you would move your diesel out. And for instance, if you had 100 trucks, you would you were doing them on a five-year basis. So you go 20 uh, a year for five years and you're through with it. Okay, that, that would do, if you did that, it would be three million barrels of oil a day is what natural gas would replace. Seventy percent of all the oil used every day in the world goes to transportation fuel. So if you want to go at, at the problem, you have to, of course, look at the biggest user. So here, though, it, we, the United States, uses 20 million, close to it, 20 million barrels a day, 90 million produced in the world. So we're using 20% uh, of the world's daily supply. Closest to us is China, 10 million barrels a day. So half of ours is what the Chinese have. But back to what would happen. We, we get, of our imported oil, which is around 11 million barrels, that 4.5 million of it comes from OPEC. So four and a half from OPEC, and you're getting less than two out of the Persian Gulf. Of course, you know, uh, uh, Angola, uh, Venezuela, and all are OPEC countries, too, not on the Persian Gulf. So here, if you pulled out of the Persian Gulf, you would go off away from two million barrels, and you have another two and a half from the rest of OPEC. You put the trucks on there, and you'll reduce it to three million. So you cut 75% of OPEC out in five years with eight million trucks. It's, it's an offer you cannot pass up. It is huge. And uh, moving quickly, because I know my, I, I don't know where they have a hook to take you off here if you, if you run over. I, I've been taken off several times different ways. But <laughs> anyway, the, if, if, you, uh, uh, if you look at free markets, there's no free market for oil. And that's what the senator told me. He said, uh, I'm for free markets. I said, I am too. And he said, well, then why are you trying to, uh, you know, promote natural gas instead of oil? Let the free market take care of it. There's no free market for oil. Oil is controlled by OPEC. Look at what's happened in the last nine months. The OPEC has come down from 32 million barrels of production a day to 30. Why? not because they're declining, it's because they want the price above 100. There are two prices for oil. One is Brent North Sea, and the uh, uh, Mideast oil is priced off of Brent North Sea oil. Today it's like $113 a barrel. Then there's West Texas Intermediate, which is the, our oil in the United States, WTI. WTI is $93 a barrel. So there's $20 difference. So your 20% difference between Brent and North Sea, you say, well, 
why not use all WTI? You have to import about 11 million barrels. So that's coming in to you. Gulf Coast, a little west coast, and then the northeast are receiving that oil. And that's the way your gasoline is priced, is off of that oil coming in from what we call Brent North Sea price. It comes in, goes through the refining process, and then they have to make a margin on it, and the price of gasoline comes out $3.75 or whatever it is. And then that spreads across the country. So your Midwest refineries, which are not using Brent North Sea, they're using Bakken out of North Dakota and the Williston Basin into their refineries. It's coming into them at maybe under 93, 91, say. And, but they get to enjoy the, mar the, the price that's set by Brent North Sea, which is the Arab crude coming into us. So it's, there's, it's not a free market for oil, but I don't think many people realize that is the case. Uh, you've got to, there's some archaic uh, state and federal uh, uh, regulations and taxes that, uh, that are sitting out there that need to be wiped out. They're state stuff, but it would, it would help. In most cases, it's, it's, it's costing more to get on domestic natural gas than to stay on diesel. And so that causes a little bit of a problem. But uh, those things need to be wiped out, and they will be in time. Uh, the, uh, the SPR, Strategic Petroleum Reserve, that needs to be addressed because if we have all these resources in America, and by the way, our oil in the last three years has gone up two million barrels a day. We're the only country in the world that is increasing production. It's incredible because in the world there have been five million wells drilled in history of all the wells drilled. It's about five million wells. And believe it or not, in the United States, we've drilled over half of them. So you say, well, my God, the United States is all drilled up. No, your industry has done an unbelievable job with their technology and recovery and all. When I got out of school in 51, at that point, it was generally accepted that 90% of all the oil found in the world at that time had been found by uh, American geologists and geophysicists. We were that good, but they were somewhat behind in technology, education, and everything else. Over time, that 90% went down uh, to whatever, 70 or 75. But anyway, it's now back up to 90. We're back, our, our uh, scientists have brought us back up too. There isn't anybody that ever gets up and in any speech says, you know, the oil and gas industry has been a, done a good job for our country. They employ more people than anybody else. They pay more taxes than anybody else. And they found us a great amount of oil and gas and we are now number one in gas and moving up fast on oil. In fact, people predict that we will produce more oil by 2020. I don't agree with this. 2020 than the Saudis do. So it's the, the industry is, should be applauded. The, uh, the SPR, that, that was 40 years ago when we put SPR in place. You remember uh, we were going to put 750 million barrels in storage in the event we had an interruption of supply like we did in 1973 when you had the Arab embargo and we got cut off from oil and my God, what's going to happen to us? We didn't realize that we were sitting here with resources that we, we had no idea that we had at that point. So we put in SPR and then over time filled it up 750 million barrels. Today, that isn't necessary. You don't need 750 million barrels in reserve. I think that what you ought to do is you've got to watch out. You can't pull it out of, of that uh, SPR too quick or you will then disrupt the market and then you, you can't let the government manipulate the market here in the United States. <clears throat> so uh, you would take it out over 10 year period, but don't turn it over to the government that it would go to alternative energy and all to, that would be the funding to take care of, of uh, the country 
uh, over the next 10 years, which would be ample to accomplish all those things. Um, North American Energy Alliance, I proposed this, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago, and I got one edit, uh, uh, piece, uh, editorial page. It wasn't my op-ed piece, but it was picked up by the Houston Chronicle. They thought it had some merit, and there was never, I could never find another article written on it, so nobody was very interested in my idea. Today, if you looked at it and said, do a North American Energy Alliance, put Canada, Mexico with the United States, we provide markets for them. We ha we'll have, I think within six months, they're finishing up a pipeline now from the United States to Mexico. We have gas going into Mexico all the time. And actually, I think that Mexico is the largest purchaser of Exxon gasoline uh, in, in the world. I think that's a good number. But they, they buy a lot of refined products from us, but we are gonna move 2.4 billion cubic feet of gas, natural gas, into Mexico within the next few months. They need us, and it's not because they don't have the resources, their technology uh, is just not advanced to where they can develop a lot of things they have, but we could. And so we could provide something to Mexico. We don't have to have equity in their oil and gas reserves. Just help them with what they have, but we have the right to purchase their oil is, and work together. Canada has plenty of gas and oil, and for gosh sakes, that Keystone Pipeline, if you have any influence anywhere, that, how much time? I'm out? <laughs> you can't just cut me off like that. <laughs> two minutes, okay. All right, two minutes, and I'm out of here. All right, this subject, believe me, I know the subject, and I know what I'm talking about on it. We need a plan for the country, and it needs to be all American. And we can, with our resources, take care of ourselves. We do not require anything from the Mideast or any place else. It's all here. Develop it and build our economy back on, on the back of cheap energy. Thank you very much.